Welcome back to another episode of the Talking Balls podcast. Today, I'm joined by a very special guest, UEFA Cup, England international and double FA Cup winner and all-round Tottenham legend, Mickey Hazard. Mickey, how are you? Very good, thank you, Luke. Uh, the first question I have to ask you, Mickey, as a Sunderland-born lad, how did a move to Tottenham's youth team come about and how did you find life in North London early on? Well, obviously, Will Dixon, who was assistant manager at Spurs on Terry Neal, he was born and bred in Sunderland. And um, he decided to set up a little scout network up in Sunderland and a guy called, called Ken Pedderston ran it. So Ken was a lovely guy and he used to come and watch me from about the age of 11 Every single game that I ever played in school, town, county, wherever I played, he was there and he befriended my dad. And in the end, by the time, uh, you know, he'd been watching me for a year, he was coming around our house. Um, we were going around his house, he was giving me extra training. Um, and everything became sort of geared to when I hit 14, uh, when I could actually sign for a club outside of my town. Um, so at the age of 14, Obviously, all the work that Ken had put into impressing my dad and my mum to get my signature, um, obviously it worked because when the decision had to be made at the age of 14, um, my sign for Spurs um, was the right decision. At the age of 14, travelling backwards and forwards to London with my dad, um, because I was obviously a minor, so travelling, he would come with me stay in the hotel with me, etc. And we would train with Spurs. Some days I'd train with the first thing. And, um, you know, training when you're a young kid of 14, 15, and you train with people that you watch on TV, it's, it's an amazing thing. And, and being so shy as well, but not shy in the pitch. Um, you know, and I, I absolutely loved going backwards and forwards to Tottenham. But then at the age of 16, suddenly it was real. Suddenly there was going down to Tottenham, but no going on. I've never been away from my parents. I've never been away from my brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles or friends. And here I was going to London and I wasn't going to be going back for quite a while. Um, so like most youngsters who've sort of left them at the age of 16 to go and fulfill their dreams to be a professional footballer, um, I got homesick and, and very badly. Um, and often, late at night, 11, 12 o'clock at night, you'd, you'd catch me climbing down the drain pipe and running down to Tottenham High Road, getting on the, uh, the bus to Seven Sisters and the tube to King's Cross and the train home to Sunderland. Um, and I think I did that five or six times um, during the first year. And I have to be honest that it was, if it wasn't for Tottenham sort of stepping in and stepping in to help in a big, and I mean a really, really big way. Um, I might never have come back to Tottenham. Um, so Tottenham toughed it with me. They, they sort of said to me, if I don't come back, they'll retain my registration and I won't be able to sign for any other club. Um, but they invited me and my dad back um, and had a meeting with us. And they worked out a, a plan whereby every 10th day, they would send me on for five days. Um, so I would play, train there for 10 days, play in two games, two youth team games, and then they'd give me five days off. They'd pay me quite a bit of money from my parents to look after me while I was home, train fares, taxes, expenses, etc., food on trains. Uh, so they trapped me brilliant. And they, did, and they did this for two years. It was absolutely amazing. So it showed me just how much they wanted me. But after about a year, I'd settled. I didn't need to go home to Sunderland anymore. Um, so. But thanks to Spurs, really, um, that sort of very, very tough period of my life, you know, that warm sickness, um, they helped me overcome it and, and uh, ever grateful because in the end, what, what I achieved at Spurs was second to none. Coming through into a first team with the likes of Glenn Hoddle, Ricky Villa, Garth Crooks, Ozzy Ardila, Steve Perryman, did you ever feel overawed by the quality of the squad as a youngster or did you always back your ability? It's a great question, and it's great because as a youngster, I was possibly the most shyest individual you will ever, ever, ever meet. Um, so when I walked into Tottenham full-time for the first time, 
and had to sit in the dressing room with all these players that I knew to say hello to or, or anything because of the trip, two week trips here and there throughout the previous two years. Um, it was one of total and complete overall. I was so overall. I couldn't speak. I couldn't even look at them. Um, I used to sit in my in the dressing room with all these players, not saying a word, just putting my kit on. And then when my kit was on and my boots were on, I would sit down and wait for the manager to see it come out and train. And I, I don't think I spoke for for, for the first two years for him at the club. Um, but when we went under the pitch, uh, I never held any fears. I didn't know I wasn't afraid of anyone. I didn't fear anyone. I wasn't overawed by anyone. Um, maybe a little bit Glen Hall because he, he quickly became my sort of hero. But in general, I always felt that this was where I was born to be. I was a gifted footballer, talented, skillful, creative. Uh, and I always felt at home on the football pitch. Um, so it didn't matter whether there was 100,000 people there or one person there. I never felt intimidated or overawed by any situation um, because I had belief in my talent. Um, my skill, my I, I knew that if I was performing to the best of my ability or even close to the best, uh, nobody could stop me. So I never had any fears of uh, the game of football. But the minute the game of football was over when we got back in the dressing room, I couldn't speak. I literally, got, I just couldn't speak. I was, and if anyone spoke to me, I'd go bright red. Um, because I was so shy because I didn't want to speak back. So it was a, off the pitch was a, an horrendous period for me, really coping with um, shyness and, and, and um, so I, was, I suppose overall was, is a good word for it as well. Um, it was an horrendous little period. Um, but as I said, on the pitch, I had, I had no fears for me whatsoever. I, I mean, I trained with these guys when I was 14 as well, uh, as a schoolboy. So I knew, that I could, I could act it. I knew I could mix it with them. I knew I was as skillful as them and talented as them. So on the pitch, I had the complete belief in myself. Uh, off the pitch, none. I just didn't want to speak. Tough. In a star-studded side, which player do you think was the most underrated player you played with at Tottenham? Uh, my opinion, you know, in a, in a team of superstars. Um, so even the two players that I'm going to mention now were still big stars, really. Um, Tony Galvin, we signed from Goo Town for £6,000. Um, and he quickly established himself in the first team in a position that nobody else enjoyed playing. I hated it, Glenn hated it, Ricky Villa hated it. We all got tried out with other people. Um, nobody could quite manage to play this role the way Tony Galvin played it. Um, and he quickly became established and, and, and actually brilliant in the team. And he was such an outlet for people like myself and Glenn and Ozzy who could feed passes into space for him to run onto. And he would run all day long um, and, and turned out to be an absolutely top Spurs player in a in a, what was a brilliant Spurs team. So Tony Galvin for me would be the most unsung hero. Um, but also I'd, I'd, I'd Chris Hewton. Chris Hewton for me was one of the best left fullbacks, if not the best in Europe at that time. He was a brilliant footballer and, uh, and and obviously I think in any team with less superstars, um, I think he would have been even more revered than he is because um, he was that good. Um, but when you've got Glenn Oddle and you've got Archibald, goal scorer, Audi, Audi Ardila, World Cup winner, Ricky Bailey, World Cup with Steve Perryman, Cap, it's difficult to steal the headlines away from them. Um, so Chris would be... Um, my second man uh, uh, as unsung hero, even though he was a hero. Um, but he was uh, both of them top, top players who um, could have easily been uh, as big a names as Glen Oddle. They were that good of players. Um, so, yeah, those Tony Galvin, Chris Hugh would be my two unsung heroes of that, that particular Spurs team. A lot of people know about what a great manager Keith Berkershaw was for Tottenham on the pitch, but. How important was he for you in helping you as both a footballer and a person? Uh, I, you know, as a youngster, you know, Keith was the manager. You know, when I ran off form, for instance, Keith was the manager who, who helped um, organise and set up this day where I could go home every 10th day. I think it's important 
not just as a youngster, but as, as, as a, an adult. I think it's important to have trust in the people that are looking after you. Um, so Keith, you know, arriving as a 16-year-old full-time professional footballer, I had to trust Keith in every way, shape, or form, not just his ability to develop me as a footballer and put on the right training sessions that had, and coaching sessions that enable me to improve and develop and grow. Um, but he also had to help develop me as a person, as a character, um, because they both go hand in hand. As you develop as a person, as a character, then it enables you to develop as a footballer even quicker. So Keith was everything I would want in a manager. He was a proper, really, really nice guy. Um, he was honest as the days long, and you could actually um, trust Keith with anything. You know, he was totally trustworthy. And along with Peter Shreves, they were the perfect team to be my management at that particular time in my career. Um, because I had to be handled with... When I was on the pitch, they could handle me with any way they wanted because I had this belief in myself. But off the pitch, I had to be handled with care because I was so shy. Um, and somehow they managed to develop my character, develop my personality, um, make me into a, a more rounded human being, and at the same time, help me become an even better footballer or a more great footballer or a more assured footballer. Uh, and it's quite a difficult job to combine the two as a management when really your role is only to develop you as a player. But they did a job, you know, forever grateful to both of them. Um, to this day, I still speak to Keith on a regular basis by telephone. Sometimes he comes up when we play golf, blah, blah, blah. Um, and he's had a massive impact on my old career from, uh, from the word go. In fact, he, he brought about one of the saddest days of my life when we won the UEFA Cup. And he resigned um, prior to it. So imagine that, the best week of my life being in the UEFA Cup final, winning it three days later. Um, sub for England at Hamden Park, the full England team at Hamden Park against Scotland. Um, and in between, Keith Burton chose resigned, my only ever manager, the guy that I held in such incredibly high esteem. Now he was leaving. So, um, yeah, absolute brilliant man, brilliant manager, forever grateful. Of course, you mentioned Keith Birkenshaw, who was your manager from both a Tottenham youth prospect when you first broke into the team. And a UEFA Cup winning Tottenham team. From that, you made your way into the England side, as you mentioned. What were the differences that you felt between becoming an established Tottenham player and becoming an England international? Um, well, I didn't quite fulfil the England international bit because I, you know, to, to be an England international, you should be in 100 squads, 50 squads, 60 squads. Um, I should have been one, no doubt about it. Um, you know, you know what? When I look back over my career and I think of all the wonderful moments that I had and, and, and the proud the proud moments, you know, every time I pulled on the Spurs shirt, there was a sense of pride and it was a pride from within that I'd came through the system as a a twelve year old boy right the way through to um, winning the UEFA Cup final say. Um and so everything that I did at Spurs, I always felt that I was very proud in in everything that I did for Spurs. And to this day, even at now at the age of 60, I I sort of, anything that I do at Spurs when I work there, I, I'm, I feel a sense of pride in, in the fact that I've done it. Um, because it's a, when something's in your blood or in your soul, you... You're very proud of it, and, and, and in every walk of your life, and every stage of your life, and everything that you do in your life, um, linked to that, my role within the club, I always feel pride, proud. Um, being picked for England, for instance, um, I felt it was a. I felt very proud. Of course, I did. Uh, I'm not disputing that. I did. I did. Uh, and obviously, when I was in the changing room, getting changed up Danvers Park. And I was pulling on the, the England kit. Again, there was a sense of pride. But I felt like it was more because of how my parents would be feeling that I'd been picked for my country. Um, because no doubt it's, it's probably every parent's dream 
well, it is every parent's dream for their children to succeed in whatever path they choose. And suddenly to see your son being picked for England must have given them so much pride and joy. Um, so I feel like when I pulled the England kit on, it was the pride based on the pride that my parents would be feeling. Whereas the Spurs thing is something that sort of materialised over, what is it now, 40, 40 45, 46 years um, that I've sort of been connected or working or linked to the club in some capacity. Um, so it's very difficult to not um, let it, one, get inside your blood, get inside your soul and, and, and it grow and grow and grow and with each uh, passing year. You know, I look at myself at 60 now and every time I walk down the tunnel onto the pitch now at the, at the new stadium, um, I get goosebumps, I get a lump in my throat because who knows when I'm ever going to do that again. So each time that I do it today, it becomes more poignant and more because of my age. I, can, I can't imagine how Cliff Jones at the age of 85, who won the double in 61, at the age of 85, every time he walks down that tunnel, he must want to cry uh, because it's been the vast majority of his life. And here he is at the age of 85, walking down into a stadium where he's been hero worship. The most wonderful feeling, and, and, I, and I experience it now at 16. And every time I walk down that tunnel and out onto that pitch, I walk down there and I, and I always think, I wonder how many more times I'm going to do this in my lifetime. Uh, you know, and it, it is, it's, it's sheer joy, it's sheer pride. And I, I, I don't think you can have that pride without loving something so much. Um, and if you've been, with something for 45, 46 years, um, then you can rest assured that it's, it's, it's embedded deep into your soul. Um, so yeah, uh, the difference between the England shirt and the Spurs shirt was immense really, um, because 46 years of love of my football club um, so sort of outweighs one or two appearances, uh, one or two times pulling on an England shirt. So there's no comparison. After nine years at Spurs, two FA Cups and your UEFA Cup, you eventually left the club for a transfer to Chelsea. How did that come about and how hard did you find it leaving the club? Well, it came about, um, you know, I've not, I've not heard one solitary thing on the grapevine. I've not heard, um, I'd, I'd been approached previously to, to sign for other football clubs. Arsenal tried to sign me under Dono, under Terry Nail. Um, and Alexa tried to sign up. There was quite a few clubs over the years that tap, sort of looked into trying to sign me. Um, obviously, I was knocked back and I was never interested anyway. Um, so, normally in football, you hear it on the grapevine or you see it read it in the newspaper before it happens. And uh, I was in the Spurs team on the Saturday playing Newcastle. We won White Hart and we won 5 1. I scored. Uh, celebrating in the players' lounge after the game, Pete Shreves, the then manager, calls me out. Look, Mickey, um, I've come to tell you that the club have accepted a, a record offer from Chelsea Football Club for you. Um, obviously, they've got a cash flow problem and they need to sell, so um, they've had an offer on the table for you and they've accepted it. So we've, they've set a meeting with you um, for Monday. Obviously, this was a Saturday and so you can imagine my shock, number one, um, my disgust, number two, and my anger, number three, as I drove down Tottenham High Road to go on, um, thinking, how oh, could they do this to me? I've been here since the age of 12. What are they doing? Why are they selling me? Blah, 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 blah. You know, and of course, um, spent the whole weekend sulking and angry. Went on, uh, sorry, went to the meeting on the Monday with John Holland. And somehow, um, much to my dismay today, somehow, um, and I know how, but somehow, I, I, I won't say publicly, but somehow they persuaded me to sign and they wanted me to sign before I left the hotel that day. Um, so 
stupidly, I signed um, the contract there and then. Um, and then spent six months really struggling to settle at Chelsea. You know, I'd, Spurs were... I'd only ever known the Tottenham way. It was the only only way I ever wanted to play. The Tottenham way, the beautiful way, the beautiful game. Um, and then I joined a club that was a bit up and underish. I couldn't adapt to the style. I couldn't find a way of getting the ball because it kept bypassing me um, until I spoke with the individual players on the team and said, look, don't mind you booting the ball, but if I'm showing for it, give it to me. Give the ball to me. And then if I'm not on, then you can boot it. So we found a way after six or seven months of um, getting the best out of me for the good of the team. Um, the fans at Chelsea were magnificent to me. They sang my name week in, week out. They were worshipping me like Spurs fans did a huddle. Um, but the actual club, I could, it was very political and I, I didn't enjoy it. I was so used to the I was a free spirit. I loved the freedom I had at Spurs. I knew the club inside out. Um, I joined as a school boy. It was was my heart and soul, and um, felt the most comfortable that I'd ever felt anywhere in my life in, in the grounds of Tottenham Hotspur Football Club. So, um, yeah, incredibly difficult um, decision, um, and 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 why football's football, and you have to, you know, you have to go where um, you've got a club. Um, it doesn't take away from the fact that I spent the first, well, I was away for eight years. I spent eight years wishing I was back at Spurs until eventually my dream came true. And it was amazing when eventually it did. And I ended up back at Spurs and, and then um, could have moved on again um, at the age of 35 when I was past my retirement date. I was offered a few contracts at other clubs, um, but turned them all down because I wanted to finish at Spurs. That was the perfect ending to my glorious career. Following a five-year stay at Chelsea and a brief spell at Portsmouth, you joined Swindon Town, where you're managed by Aussie Ardiles and then later Glenn Hoddle. What are the differences you've seen between those mercurial players on the pitch and those as a manager? Well, I mean, as you say, the mercurial wasn't really the word. They were geniuses and uh, top as good a players as I've ever seen in this first year. So, um, my heroes, um, uh, people that I looked up to, not just as footballers, but as people. Um, and what seemed like a dream come true to go and play for your hero or heroes, um, it wasn't quite as simple as I thought it would be. Um, working for people you look up to, uh, people you played with and alongside, um, is very, very difficult. Um, because it's it's not like your teammates anymore. He's your manager, and it, they are paid to, to 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 get you to play the way uh, they want you to play. Fortunately, they both believed in the Tottenham ways, which was my way. They both both believed in the beautiful game, which again I did. And so, the actual transition from playing with them to playing for them was easy. Um, they were such preachers of the beautiful game that it just was so easy for me to fit into and adapt to that it was never a problem the problems were that um, sometimes they would ask you know, their job was to ask me to do something that maybe I didn't want to do <laughs> so um, because we were teammates um, I would sort of come back at them in, in public maybe uh, in front of all the other players and the other player set the wrong example in reality. Um, I mean, there's a classic um, fly on the wall documentary at Swindon Town when me and Glenn have a big confrontation. Um, you know, and that's sort of a father son relationship. You know, a father who manages a 14 year old school's team and the 14 year old plays for the, and, and somehow the father and dad row with each other because they're so close. Um, and that's consequently what happened between sort of me and Ozzy or me and Glenn because we we were so close. We were teammates together. And, uh, 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 and so um, sometimes we're too close and, and, and they would ask me to do something and I would challenge it and confront them on it. And um, 
they would often speak to me in private and say, look, Nick, come on, man, we're mates. But when we're at work, I'm your manager, and you've got to listen to as I ask. And so that side of it was very difficult. The football inside was just absolute pleasure. It was um, heaven playing in their teams. Um, it was something, it was like playing for Spurs. Um, the way that the, the, the ball circulated through the team, the way it was played on the floor, um, the quality with which it was played was just amazing and for, for a team of such a small club. Um, and it, it's a reflection of them as players and as people is that they had beliefs in how it should be played and they went and, uh, and stood by those beliefs when they became managers. And it really was a joy, but it wasn't as easy as I thought it would be because dealing with the other side, the side that, well, you're my friend. You can't ask me to do that. You're my friend. You know, it's not like that. It, it was, you're my manager and I've got to listen to you now. Um, so, but I had three incredibly happy years at Swindon playing in a style of football that was just a joy to play in. We won promotion to the Premier League, um, which was wonderful. Um, and it was a shame, really, that the the club just didn't have the financial clout to survive in the Premier League, really, because it was a wonderful little club and I had many happy, t happy times there. Um, was blessed to have played with Glenn and with Ozzy and played for them. Um, because every day when you're playing with or for such geniuses, there's something new to be learned. And every day of my life, I, even to this day, I learn things off them. I play golf with them. And, and I'm always learning from them because the geniuses and, um, you know, the great thing about genius, I'm not even sure the geniuses know when that little gem of a piece of information comes out their mouth. Um, and the important part is, is that you have to be ready to listen to it and take it on board because it's there every minute. Every time they open their mouth, there's a potentially a gem coming out. So listen carefully. But no. It was a pleasure to play for both of them. I love them. They're great friends to this day. Um, and obviously, um, Glenn's been through some illness recently. Um, but he's recovered fully and, and doing very well. So I'm delighted. Rewind to last year and 24 years since your last appearance for Spurs. Uh, you're laced up again, pulling on a Tottenham top to play at the new stadium in the Legends match. How did that compare to your experience at the old White Hart Lane? Well, I, it's, it's um, obviously it's not something that you would ever begin to compare because when it's for real, um, it's for real and it means so much more. But what I will say is that um, the older you get, um, every moment that you walk down that tunnel, whether it be for an off-time interview, whether it be for a Legends game against Inter Milan, it, it, it becomes so much more poignant. Um, so much more gets you, you know, like you get goosebumps. You know, when I when I talk about that Inter Milan game, the opening of the new stadium, it brings goosebumps throughout my old body. Um, I get a lump in my throat because. Um, when I walk down the tunnel uh, and I see Tadaris to do or Dare to or my one and only club, all of these things seem to carry so much more meaning because, you know, as you get older, the one thing you, you can't affect is when you no longer will see those things anymore or do those things anymore. Um, and it's no longer it sort of in your control to a certain degree you can't predict uh, when we will pass so they become so much more meaningful so much more um, so much more you have so much more passion for it because when you're young you think it's going to happen forever more um, you know you, all those what times walking up the tunnel all of those times walking out of the um, and now it, even when I worked there on the match thing, um, they asked me to do an off-time interview on the pitch. I find myself absolutely lost in a in a past uh, memory, uh, and, and find myself thinking, 
will I ever do this again? Um, walk out on the pitch in front of the Spurs faithful uh, to great cheers um, and applause and, and sit there and answer questions with Paul Coy. Um, it, you, you, your mind can't help but wonder. Um, you know, like on my 60th birthday, for instance, I had no ideas. I entered the club that day. What the club had planned for me, they gave me a, 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 a Spurs shirt on the pitch at half time. 60th birthday on the back. So it, the whole thing is, is so much more in your own mind, so much more meaningful, so much more poignant um, because of your age. Because, you know, this, this football club has played a role in all of our lives that has played a, a massive influence on who we are, what we've become, the characters that we are. Um, helped in helped shape us as human beings in, in so many ways, good and bad. Um, <coughs> so, if you can go to White Hart Lane, the new stadium now, and be interviewed on the pitch as you're getting older and older and older, <coughs> and not feel incredibly emotional, then you can't have any feelings. Because every time I go there, get a tear in my eye, I get goosebumps that are and, and, and of course Paul Coit, who's an expert compare, he latches onto this <clears throat> and, he, and he knows the right questions to ask. And they all bring goosebumps. Every question that you have to answer, there's a goose goosebumps running through your body, there's a lump in your throat. You know, the finale for instance, it was a a day in my lifetime that will live with me forevermore. And every time I think of it talk about it, I get the same feeling now as I got on the day that it happened. So, yeah, as we age, all of those, that Inter Milan game was just, unfortunately for me, I snapped my Achilles on the day, so I was on a wheelchair for four months, but did it detract from the day? No, it was the most incredible day. Four months down the line, I was still on a wheelchair feeling, oh God, this I get, you know, the Achilles was wearing me out, but would I change it? Someone said to me, you can still play in Inter Milan or you can pull out and not snap your Achilles. I would play every day of the year um, because the meaning of what it meant to be back on the pitch, the meaning of, well, maybe two-thirds, more than two-thirds of my life has been spent. Um, yeah, incredible, incredible. Uh, means the world. That day meant the world. And for my children and my grandchildren to witness this, you know, my grandchildren who obviously would never have seen me play, that they were at the game. I took one of my grandchildren in the warm up on the pitch to have a kick around with us. Um, I can't imagine the joy that they were feeling um, just seeing me on the pitch because, wow, is this my granddad playing on the pitch at Spurs? You know, I, I'd, heard he, I'd heard that he played at Spurs, but I never realised he did. Um, you know, wonderful. Wonderful memory, It'll live with me forever. You've played in some great Spurs sides. What is one Spurs team you didn't play in, which you would have loved to have played in at your peak physical condition? I think that I would have. If you're going to look and pick the Spurs side, then you surely must surely want to be in the, the most successful team. I'd love to have played in the 60 61 team um, and, and, and whatever I've read about them and the style that they play it's sort of synonymous with Tottenham Hotspur Football Club so um, yeah I, I, I think there's players that I would love to have played with you know I'd love to have played with Jimmy Greaves would have been perfect for my game um, but the 60-61 team you know to, to have won the double um, you know I'll call Cliff Jones Sir Cliff because it, 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 you know he's won the he's won the double the first team in in the 19th century, was it to win the or the 20th century uh, to win the the double? Um, so to play in that team must have been something special, you know. To play in any cup-winning side is something very, very special. Um, because you know what it means to the football club, you know what it means to the fans, you know what it means to your parents, your friends, uh, the security, the laundry lady, the kit man. It, it means so much. So imagine winning the double. At a time when it was um, 
unprecedented. Unprecedented occurrence. Mm. So um, yeah, six, sixty-one team. I would, I would love to have been part of. What does what does Tottenham mean to you? Do you know what? I'm asked this question every time, and I can sit here and I, I answer the same way every time. I can sit here and say to you now that Tottenham is my life, has been my life. I can say all of those things, right? And it's something that. I would guess the vast majority of former players who spent any length of time at Spurs um, and who has a love for Spurs would would say the same things. But I like it, I like a different way of describing what Spurs football club means for me. And um, and I, and I say it with such love and I say it with such um, passion and such sadness as well because. Um, I know that one day, you know, I'm not getting any younger. I know that one day I'm not going to have this love and this passion because I'm not going to be around to have it. So I say it with a sadness too. But my way of describing the motto of football club is that my sons, who I absolutely idolise, they idolise the motto of football club. They go home and away. They have season tickets in the South Stand in the new stadium. Um, they went to every away trip in Europe. Um, my grandchildren, um, one's 15, um, two are seven, and I've got one and a half year old. The 15 year old and the seven year olds have all experienced Spurs games at home. Uh, and uh, the eldest has been to Wembley to watch them too. So um, I don't think there's any better um, way of describing what this football club means to me than to say that my, my children. My children's children, my great grandchildren, my great great grandchildren, and the generations upon generations of Azers will all be Spurs fans um, because it's in the blood. And just as, and, and the thing that makes me most proud is is that I have a, an unbelievable passion for Tottenham Hotspur Football Club, but I see the same passion in my sons, and I see the same passion. Um, and if I tell you a story about and which passion is is in my family, my um, my, my youngest grandson when he was five, Spurs were playing on, and um, we got a penalty. I don't know if you can remember Harry Kane, yeah. And I got I got sent a video from my grandson's mum. My son was at the game, so she was watching it on Sky with with her son, who was five at the time. And um, she said, oh, Harry, are you nervous? Well, Harry was taking the penalty. And my grandson, Harry, was saying, oh, yeah, I'm really nervous. And he's kicking me, I like this. And she, she decided to film the video of it. And he was sitting there watching it. And as Harry ran up to take the penalty, and as he scored, he jumped up celebrating like that thing. So his mum says to him, Harry, what do you think of that? He said, oh, yeah, Spurs Harry Kane. He said, Harry, what do you think of Arsenal? He turned to the camera and he went, fucking shit. You know, fucking shit. Oh, come on. Um, but, but, you know, I'm so proud that my, my children, my grandchildren, and, and, and all the way down the line until we no longer have boys who were called Azad. Uh, every one of them will be a Spurs fan forevermore. Um, and that makes me feel proud. It makes me, it touches my heart. It, it, it sort of gives me a sense of, um, you know, it, when you go, we all we all like to think that, you know, what legacy will we leave behind when we do go? What will, what will, what will, what will be our achievement? And as well as things that I've achieved for Spurs, I think knowing that my, Children and my children's children, etc., 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 et, cetera, et, cetera, et cetera, so on and so on and so on. All down the line, will pass on that their love for Spurs. I think that will be the legacy that will I will leave behind and will be best remembered for because the hazards will be going to Spurs forevermore. And finally, if you could go back to the Mickey Hazard that has just rocked up to North London from Sunderland, 
what's one piece of professional advice and one piece of life advice you'd give to yourself? Um, well, first of all, we'll go to the life advice. Um, you know, I've had, in my lifetime, I've had so many incredible compliments. One of the best compliments that was ever given to me, and it's, it's thanks to my parents that they got such a compliment, is that Ozzy Davis said to me, Mickey, this was only a year ago, Mickey, of all the players that I've ever met in football, you're the only one that's never changed. So my advice would be, no matter what you achieve, no matter what you, how big you become or how successful you become, be the person that you are. And the person that you are should be there, not just for oneself. You should be there for, for everyone, to help everyone. Because one day you might need help too. Um, if you're in a fortunate enough position to, to be able to help, then help. Because there's a lot of people out there who, from one day to the next, don't know where the next meal's coming from or, or are they going to survive the next day or not. Um, um, we're in a position to help, so let's help, you know, and the world will become a better place if we all adopt that, the attitude of being more kind, more caring, more giving, and more loving. If we can adopt those things as, a, as the world, um, then everything becomes so much more brighter, so much more lovely. Um, so, yeah, don't change. Uh, 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 be the person you are when you were little right through to when you pass um, and be kind, be caring, be giving, be loving um, and, and help other people uh, and leave that as your legacy when you go. From a footballing point of view is that uh, advice to young footballers coming through would be to say, look, don't ever do the same thing twice because when you're young, you know, you can do the same thing a thousand times, the kids will still fall for it. But as you progress through the the various ranks, the nearer you get to the top. Uh, and when you get to the top, you're playing against top class footballers. So when you do a trick once, the next time they're waiting for that trick because they, they look clever. Um, so don't do the same thing twice. Um, faint to do the same thing twice, but do something different. Um, because the more variation that you master, the more variation that you use, the more complex the reading of your game is for the opponent. Um, work hard, but don't just go in and work hard. Work hard on what you believe in. If you believe the game should be played in that way, go and work hard at it. Go and work hard at it. Um, make other people believe in the right way to play the game. Um, so, yeah, um, those two things are pretty good advice, I think. Um, to, to stay true to your beliefs. Don't, don't, don't lose your beliefs. Stick by them. Even when you're playing rubbish, don't lose confidence. Um, don't let, and this is the final bit I'm going to give. Final bit of, a final tip. Don't look, don't let success or failure, whether you're successful or failure, don't let it boost your confidence or not confidence. You've got to have a confidence that's on an even key that stays there whether your pass doesn't make it or your pass does make it or whether the coach out's brilliant, Mickey, or shit, Mickey. You've got to stay confident. You've got to stay level-headed and confident in your own ability and not be, not allow it to be affected by success or failure. And I, I think that's a beautiful note to end it on. Um, I could sit here and for hours upon hours upon hours talking to Spurs and just listening to your anecdotes, but you're a much busier man with a lot more responsibilities than me. So um, <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time uh, out of your day to talk to me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Good luck with what, what, good luck with what you're doing. I hope you make it a big success. I'm sure you will. Um, if you need, um, I, I can't guarantee that I will get them because obviously they've got that at the time. But if you need help and you think of someone, I can I can always speak to them to, to come and do your show for you. Um, but let me know and then and I'll see what I can do. Well, good luck Thank you very much. I'm sure you'll be a big success. Very good in